What's at the core of achieving the good life? The major key to the good life. The major key is not in learning how to set goals. It is not in learning how to better manage your time. It is not in mastering the attributes of leadership. Every day in a thousand different ways, we are trying to improve ourselves by learning how to do things. We spend a lifetime gathering knowledge in classrooms, in textbooks, in experiences. Now, if knowledge is power, if knowledge is the forerunner to success, then why do we fall short of our objectives? Why, in spite of all our knowledge and in spite of our collective experiences, do we find ourselves aimlessly wandering? settling for a life of existence rather than a life of substance. While there may be many answers to this question, the fundamental answer is the absence of discipline. Applying all that we know. That's the key word, discipline, self-discipline. We might add one more word here, consistent. Consistent self-discipline. Better than knowledge is applied knowledge. And once we've applied our knowledge, we must study the results of that process. Apply our knowledge, study the results. Refine our approach. Finally, by trying and observing and refining and trying again, our knowledge will inevitably produce worthy results, admirable results. And with the joy and results of our efforts, we continue to apply, to learn, to observe, to fuel our ambition with the positive reinforcement of continued progress. Pretty soon, we'll find that we're swept into a spiral of achievement, a vertical rise to success. But for this whole process to work for us, we must first master the art of discipline, self-discipline, consistent self-discipline. It takes consistent self-discipline to master the art of setting goals, to master the art of time management, to master the art of leadership, to master the art of parenting and relationships. If we don't make consistent self-discipline part of our daily lives, the results we seek will be sporadic and elusive. It takes a consistent effort to truly manage our valuable time, or we'll be consistently frustrated. It takes discipline to conquer the nagging voices in our minds, the fear of failure, the fear of success, the fear of poverty, the fear of a broken heart. It takes discipline to keep trying when that nagging voice within us brings up the possibility of failure. It takes discipline to admit our errors and recognize our limitations. The voice of the human ego speaks to all of us. Sometimes the voice of ego says that we should magnify our value beyond our results. It leads us to exaggerate, to not be totally honest. It takes discipline to be totally honest, both with ourselves and with others. Be certain of one thing. Every exaggeration of the truth, once detected by others, destroys our credibility and makes all that we say and do suspect. As soon as a business colleague figures out that we tend to exaggerate, guess what? They'll always think we exaggerate. And they'll never quite hold us in the same regard again. Never. It takes discipline to change a habit. Because habits are formed a little bit each day, every day, every day. Once habits are formed, they act like a giant cable. They act like a nearly unbreakable instinct that only long-term disciplined activity can change. We must unweave every strand of the cable of habits slowly and methodically until the cable that once held us in bondage becomes nothing more than scattered strands of wire. It takes the consistent application of a new discipline, a more desirable one to overcome one which is less desirable. It takes discipline to plan. It takes discipline to execute our plan. It takes discipline to look with full objectivity at the results of our applied plan. And it takes discipline to change either our plan or our method of executing that plan if the results are poor. It takes discipline to be firm when the world throws opinions at our feet. It takes discipline to ponder the value of someone else's opinion when our pride and our arrogance leads us to believe 
that we are the only ones with the answers. Now, if discipline is the key word and if discipline is the key action, then what exactly is discipline? One good answer might be that discipline is a constant human awareness of the need for action and a conscious act by us to implement that action. If our awareness and our implementations occur at the same time, then we begin a valued sequence of disciplined activity. Now here's the other side of discipline. If there's considerable time that passes between the moment of awareness and the time of our implementation, then that is called procrastination. Doing it tomorrow instead of today. Procrastination, an almost exact opposite of discipline. The voice within us says, get it done. Discipline then says, do it now. Do it to the best of your ability, today tomorrow and always, until finally, the worthy deed becomes instinctive. Procrastination says later, tomorrow, whenever I get a chance. In every circumstance we face, we are constantly presented with these two choices. Do it now or do it later. Discipline and procrastination. A choice between a disciplined existence bearing the fruit of achievement and contentment or procrastination, the easy life for which the future will bear no fruit, only the bare branches of mediocrity. The rewards of a disciplined life are great, but they're often delayed until some time in the future. The rewards for the lack of discipline are immediate, but they are minor in comparison to the immeasurable rewards of consistent self-discipline. An immediate reward for lack of discipline is a fun day at the beach. A future reward of discipline is owning the beach. For most, we choose today's pleasure rather than tomorrow's fortune. So how can you get rid of the easy distractions? How can you keep your mind on what you're trying to do? How can you keep an attitude of doing it all and doing it now? How can you make the choice of discipline over procrastination? How can you stay focused on your ambitions? You can keep your focus on your work. You can get it done today instead of tomorrow. You've got to really work on your consistent self-discipline on a daily basis, or you'll find yourself distracted. Distracted by negative thoughts, distracted by negative people. And pretty soon, depending on the type of people you've associated with, distracted by your doubts within yourself. Never underestimate the power of influence and associations. And never underestimate the power of your own consistent self-discipline. Now let's take a closer look at discipline, at the three steps to becoming disciplined. First, true discipline is not the easiest option. Most people would rather sleep until 10 o'clock than get up at 6. It's easier to go to bed late, sleep late, show up late, leave early. It's easier not to read. It's easier to turn on the television than to open a book. It's easier to do just enough than to do it all. Waiting is always easier than acting. Trying is always easier than doing. Imagine what life would be like if we didn't have to make our bed in the morning or keep our garage clean or pay our taxes or show up for work tomorrow. Wouldn't it be fascinating if we didn't have to do these things, wouldn't it be fascinating? What do you suppose would become of us? You're right, not much. For whatever the reason, the system we live in and contribute to is designed to make the easiest things in life the most unprofitable. Profitable seems to be the most difficult. Our world is and always will be a constant battle between the life of ease and its momentary rewards and a life of discipline and its far more significant rewards. Each has its own price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. We will pay one or the other. What we wish we had done is the voice of regret, speaking in a sorrowful tone at a time when there is no going back. This is regret. No second chance. 
No, what would I do differently? Choose one or the other, but both will have their price, the price of discipline or the price of regret. One costs pennies, the other a fortune. The first lesson of discipline is that it isn't the easiest option. The second lesson of discipline is that it's a full-time activity. And we've said that the best form of discipline is consistent self-discipline. You see, the discipline that it takes to make your bed every day is the same discipline necessary for success in the world of business. The discipline to organize your garage is the same discipline to organize your business. All disciplines carry through to affect all parts of our lives. If we're disciplined in just one area and lazy in another, guess what? Pretty soon, the lazy side will creep in and destroy the discipline side. The bad habits in one area of our life will eventually destroy our self-discipline in the areas we've been working on. Consistency cannot be inconsistent. Discipline is the mind being trained to control our lives. Discipline is a set of standards which we've selected as a personal code of conduct. Discipline is imposing on ourselves the requirements for honoring these standards. Once we've adopted these standards of behavior and conduct, we're committed to honor them. And if we don't, then there can be no disciplined activity. We find ourselves announcing our standards to our relatives, our friends, our associates. We shout our beliefs and condemn those who believe any differently, but then we don't walk the talk. We end up acting in a way far different from the beliefs we've shouted. We tell our kids that the TV is rotting their minds, yet we spend our evenings in front of it. We tell our employees that they must take advantage of every minute of the working day, yet we spend three hours at lunch. Do as I say, not as I do. This is inconsistent. This leads to a loss of credibility among those who watch us. And more importantly, this leads to a loss of credibility within ourselves. The only thing worse than one who is inconsistent in applying their self-imposed disciplines is one who has never considered the need or the value of discipline at all. These people seem to wander aimlessly, changing procedures, changing standards, changing loyalties, and shifting frequently from one commitment to another, leaving behind a trail of broken friendships, unfinished projects, and unfulfilled promises all because of a discipline that was either non-existent or imposed so infrequently that it was ineffective. Here's the third step to becoming consistently self-disciplined. Number one is realizing that discipline isn't the easiest option. Number two, discipline is a full-time activity, day by day, every day, and the third step to becoming self-disciplined is really a philosophy that holds one of life's unique promises. Number three simply says, for every disciplined effort, there is a multiple reward. That's one of life's great arrangements. It's like the law of sowing and reaping. In fact, it's an extension of the biblical law that says if you sow well, you reap well. Now here's a unique part of the law of sowing and reaping. Not only does it suggest that we'll all reap what we've sown, it also suggests that we'll reap much more. Life is full of laws that both govern and explain behaviors. But this may well be the major law we need to understand. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. For every disciplined effort, a multiple reward. What a concept. If you render unique service, your reward will be multiplied. If you're fair and honest and patient with others, your reward will be multiplied. If you give more than you expect to receive, your reward is more than you expect. But remember, the key word here, as you might well imagine, is discipline. Everything of value requires care and attention. Everything of value requires discipline. Children require discipline. They must have a structure built for them. 
They must have boundaries to work within so they feel secure and comfortable to explore and grow. They must learn to recognize what's right and what's wrong, what's acceptable behavior, what's not acceptable. Children require unwavering discipline, consistent discipline, or they'll be confused as to how they're supposed to behave. Likewise, our thoughts require discipline. We must set up our inner boundaries, our codes of conduct, or our thoughts will be confused. And with confused thoughts, we'll end up being confused, hopelessly lost in the maze of life. And confused thoughts produce confused results. Look around you at this very moment in time. What might you be doing that needs attention? Perhaps you're on the brink of giving up or starting over or starting out. And the only missing ingredient to your incredible success story in the future is a new and self-imposed discipline that will make you stay longer and try harder and work more intensely than you ever thought you possibly could. The most valuable form of discipline is the one that you impose on yourself. Don't wait for things to deteriorate so drastically that someone else must impose discipline into your life. Wouldn't that be tragic? How could you possibly explain the fact that someone else thought more of you than you thought of yourself? That they forced you to get up early and get out into the marketplace when you would have been content to let success go to someone else who cared more about themselves. Your life, my life, the life of each one of us is going to serve as either a warning or an example. A warning of the consequences of neglect, self-pity, lack of direction and ambition, or an example of talent put to use.